told in many medieval chronicles. So it apparently captured the imagination of people around him, and we don't know if others tried to repeat his feat, but it sounds like there was scientific interest in his attempts at flight. So the point is that the first human being that we know of, whoever flew, was a medieval monk. So when everyone tells you that the Middle Ages were the Dark Ages, you can point to the story of Almer of Malmesbury and suggest otherwise. Here are some other innovations that appear in the Middle Ages. Cloth making introduced the first concepts of industrialization with the spinning wheel in 1350, and cloth merchants consolidated their operations from scattered rural households to urban centers. The cloth merchant oversaw groups of weavers and organized them into centralized workshops. This spawned the model that would eventually result in factories where laborers would work for a manager or management guild. By the end of the 14th century, guilds of craftsmen and merchants developed rudimentary companies and increasingly used mechanical power instead of using organic power that came from draft animals or humans. The water mill, for example, is probably the first such piece of technology that comes to mind that utilized power that was greater than what a human could do. Medieval craftsmen and tradesmen began mechanizing power in ways that the Romans had never done. The Romans did have water mills, and some were efficient. They rarely used them, because the Romans had millions of slaves. With all that literal manpower, they didn't need machines. What was the point when they had these organic machines that did what was ordered of them as long as they were fed? But the Roman status quo changed in the Middle Ages, because the population declined and fluctuated, resulting in the need for more efficient technology. As a result, water mills became widespread across a continent. In Roman-era Britain, there might have been a few hundred water mills. But by the time of the Norman conquest of 1066, we have accounts of the Domesday Book, which was a massive inventory taken by William the Conqueror to determine what he had conquered in England, and he found there were 5,624 water mills across England. And that's just in England. There must have been tens of thousands of other water mills across Europe. So medieval people started harnessing technology in a game-changing way. With the same way that water mills were mechanized, other craftsmen may have thought, all right, what other machines can we build? So they build windmills. And windmills are probably the most efficient means of harnessing mechanical power in that time period before you get up to the steam engine. Then they also started building tidal mills. And there were all sorts of things that they could apply these mills to. They could grind grain, so you don't have to do it by hand. You could make leather. And most importantly, they made the trip hammer. This was a mechanical implement that changed the metal flattening process. Instead of a blacksmith banging a piece of metal with his arm, you could build a trip hammer that weighed hundreds and hundreds of pounds, hook it up to a water mill or a tidal mill, and it could bang metal all day. Suddenly, you have mass production that's almost semi-industrial suddenly you have a far higher abundance of metal, and you can see this change in the way the armor is used. A Roman soldier went into battle with maybe a male shirt, because iron and steel was much more scarce, since if a human had to pound away all the time, there wasn't as much in circulation. But with a trip hammer, there was much more metal available, a blacksmith could easily crank out a lot more armor, and a medieval knight by the 14th and 15th centuries went into battle wearing a full suit of case-hardened steel. Trip hammers also led to the use of glass furnaces, which were powered by bellows. Then they developed mass production of cast iron, which led to the production of cannons. So medieval craftsmen were mechanizing all sorts of things. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. And one of the most important innovations that might not be as sexy as flying machines or armor or cannons, but was far more important to your average person in the Middle Ages, was technological advancement when it came to agriculture. The invention of the horse collar in the 12th century allowed horses to use their full power when hauling. A horse collar is part of a horse harness that distributes the load around a horse's neck and shoulders when pulling a wagon or plow. Before this, you had a yoke or a breast collar where a horse pulled with his shoulders. But what the yoke did was it put pressure on the horse's windpipe, so if it pulled too hard, then it would strangle itself. 
but the collar allowed the horse to use its full strength when pulling, essentially enabling the animal to push forward with its hind quarters into the collar. This allowed a horse to apply 50% more power to a task than an ox, because a horse could move faster, and horses had greater endurance than an ox. So this increased agricultural output by 50%. Imagine that. You're living practically on subsistence living. Suddenly you have 50% more food. You could also use heavier plows, especially the moldboard plow, which reduced the amount of time needed to prepare a field and allowed a farmer to work a larger area of land. And previously unarable lands could now be planted and produce crops. This was way more sophisticated than the Roman scratch plow to till the soil, which worked fine in thin Mediterranean soils, but was useless in northern Europe. But thanks to the moldboard plow and the horse collar, France, Britain, Germany, northern Europe became agriculturally robust in later centuries. Even though they were largely unproductive in Roman and early medieval times, in thick, heavy forest land. These heavy, wet soils could be plowed, turned into farmland, which turned the sod, cut into the earth, and turned it over. This made the whole of Northern Europe much more agriculturally productive. In areas like Germany, which are sort of backwaters in the Roman Empire, become the center of the High Middle Ages and the early modern period. Partly due to the population increase, the increased agricultural output, the increased amount of food, and farmers were also more productive, so you could allow more diversification in the economy. Fewer farmers were needed per field, which was a boon to plague-ravaged 14th century Europe. And the trend of retreat to rural locations and small villages after the fall of Rome gradually reversed as more people gravitated towards cities, increasing urban population, and leading to the growth of specialized skills like carpentry and weaving. Let's go back to clocks one more time about medieval technology. Clocks in the Middle Ages likely appear in the late 13th and early 14th centuries. By the middle of the 14th century, clocks shrunk from what you would see in town squares and clock towers to portable devices, clocks that could be used in homes. And then around the 15th century, you have the pendulum clock, which vastly increases the accuracy of clocks. This allows for timekeeping on ships. You have a much better estimation of where you're located when you're on the high seas and you don't have references of land to tell you where you are. But with accurate timepieces, you also have the commodification of time. If we think about simple transactions, it means that you could charge people not just for a job they completed, but how long it took them. A priest could say to a carpenter, well, half an hour of your time of fixing the church exterior is worth this. So the early ideas of hourly wages come out of the Middle Ages because now you can accurately track how long an hour is. It's not as if this was done universally, of course. And if you're working on a farm, you might not care too much about hours of the day, and you would track your day with environmental conditions and the rising of the sun. If you're on the farm, then you wouldn't care too much about hours. But then when you go into the town square and are bartering or negotiating and working on a contract, then that would come into play. So all that to say, some of the most important inventions we have today, clocks, plows, at the end of the Middle Ages, the printing press which is another application of mechanical power invented by medieval people, all these things came out in the Middle Ages. All right, so that is technological advancement in the Middle Ages. Now let's talk about labor. It turns out that a medieval peasant probably worked less than you think, and he probably worked less than you do if you're a typical participant in the economy of the Western world. Now, that's surprising because when we think of the feudal system, we imagine peasants as on the very bottom of the social pyramid, and that's true. The feudal system, which, if we consider England, was introduced by the Normans and a codified pyramid scheme in which labor and tax revenue flowed up. At the top of the pyramid was the king. Below him were barons or tenants in chief. The king granted them land in exchange for service as his vassals. They'd swear an oath of loyalty and provide soldiers to fight for a certain number of days a year. These barons in turn granted land to knights who fought for a determined number of days. So all this service flows upward, knight to baron, baron to king. The bottom of the social pyramid was a massive base of peasants, or villains, and few professions sound less glamorous. They weren't free and were legally bound to their land. Many of them probably never walked more than a few miles from the location of their birth for their entire lives. 
In addition to working their own harvest, they farmed their lord's land for two to three days a week. And additional work was required at harvest time. We think of a peasant as wearing little more than a burlap sack and walking around with a back bent from a lifetime of hard labor. What do they do for fun? If we don't know about this period, we'd think of them talking with their plague-ridden neighbor or going to the town square to check out the latest witch burning. Part of the reason that we associate terrible labor conditions with the Middle Ages doesn't have to do with the Middle Ages, but ideas about a time period which most people do have a better knowledge, and that's the 19th century, specifically an image painted by Charles Dickens of the 19th century English workhouse, or factories of the 19th century before the rise of the labor movement. Now, these places were definitely miserable to work. With the development of factories in England and the United States, owners could establish horrific work hours. Linemen would labor from dawn to dusk, six days a week. A factory man would get Sunday off and then have to go back again for another 70 to 80 hours of unsafe, monotonous work. And there wasn't even any job security. Someone could be fired for almost any reason, even if it was the factory's fault. Even if your hand were chopped off in the machinery, you would get no hazard pay or disability insurance or anything like that. There were minor reforms began with the Factory Act of 1847 in England, also known as the Ten Hours Act, which restricted the working hours of women and children. Other laws were passed in America that gradually eliminated child labor, then established overtime pay, so there wasn't a financial incentive to essentially work a person to death. Unions fought for perks such as paid vacation, pension plans, and workman's compensation. The reason I mentioned the 19th century and the terrible labor conditions there is because that can color our understanding of all labor in the past. And when we understand this trajectory of reform that I talked about, where gradually workers' rights solidify, it's easy to assume that if working conditions were this bad in the 19th century, then if you keep extrapolating that trajectory into the past— it must have been all that much worse in the Middle Ages. These people lacked the benefit of democracy or constitutions their 19th century worker counterparts at least had recourse to. But surprisingly, that wasn't the case at all. According to a book by Juliet Shore entitled The Overworked American, The Unexpected Decline of Leisure, while labor in the Middle Ages was physically intensive, like plowing or harvesting, a peasant had far more leisure time than a 21st century worker. He could enjoy anywhere between eight weeks and half the year off, way more than the typical two weeks off in the United States and maybe up to six weeks in Europe. The Catholic Church had a considerable number of saints' days and feast days, and on a feast day, it meant that you actually feasted with your friends and family, abstaining from labor. The Church even enforced mandatory holidays a word that comes from the term holy day. If a relative were getting married, peasants would join in the festivities, which could sometimes last up to a week. Other events, like births or deaths, included days of celebration or mourning, where peasants would drink ale, make merry if the occasion merited it, and dance to the lute of a co-laborer. Sunday, of course, was a day off, because observing the Sabbath was a cornerstone of medieval Christian practice. And if there were any local celebrations taking place, jugglers, troubadours, and others would come to town, and it was also understood that workers would restrain from labor. You could also have fun on the estate, believe it or not. Peasants gambled, danced, and wrestled together and played a primitive form of rugby. Men from two villages played on a pitch that could easily include woods and streams. Since there weren't any rules, broken bones were common. And there were other sports that were common that involved animal cruelty, like cockfighting or bear baiting, in which a bear was chained to a post and dogs attacked it. So one of the less enlightened views of the Middle Ages that is true. You're not going to find animal cruelty laws anywhere on the books. Well, anyway, according to Shore's estimates, a peasant in 14th century England might not work more than 150 days a year. And that's far less than the labor of a modern-day Westerner. The average American in their first year on the job only receives eight days of paid vacation. Of course, weekends and other days are thrown in, but it's not uncommon to work 220 to 250 days a year in the modern era. So a peasant has a better benefits package than you or I, and they were definitely better off than other people in time periods like a plantation slave in America who could literally be worked to death and often was. 
And I won't get into how miserable slavery was, but I did a podcast series on the history 